Hi, today we have debunked space myths. Five, four, three, two, one. Mark. Hi, I'm Commander Chris Hadfield, astronaut, spaceship commander, spacewalker, part-time musician. I'm here today to hopefully debunk some common space myths. Here's this common perception that you will immediately fry to a crisp by the unfiltered, unadulterated solar radiation if you get sucked out of the airlock. In truth, it's way worse than that. Oh. In the shade in space, it's like minus 250 degrees. But the part of you that's in the sun, it's plus 250 degrees at least. So it's gonna start boiling and burning. So it's like lying on a red hot stove with a piece of dry ice on your back. And your Ooh. lungs are gonna be sucked flat instantaneously. But even worse than that is your blood is gonna boil, like opening a can of pop where suddenly the, all the little bubbles come out because there's no air pressure around you. So. That whole sentence was like, but wait, there's more. Pop, he must be from Canada. He could also be from the Midwest, but I don't think that's his accent. Simultaneously, you are going to freeze, boil, burn, get the bends, and no longer be able to breathe. Not a good way to go. I've done two spacewalks, and I was very thankful to have a spacesuit around my body so that none of those things happened to me. Sometimes you hear that you have to work out constantly or you will pass out and possibly die in space. Not true. Living on a spaceship is the most lazy existence you can imagine. You're weightless. You do not have to lift a finger. You don't have to hold your head up. Your heart doesn't have to lift your blood against gravity. You can be the laziest person in the universe in space. But eventually you need to come back to Earth. And if you don't exercise for your whole six months in space, you'll sort of turn into a jellyfish. So we do exercise two hours a day on a spaceship. We have a resistive machine, we have a unicycle, oh. and we have a treadmill where elastics hold us down just to keep our bodies strong enough and our bones dense enough so when we get home, we don't just fall over like a puddle, but you don't need to work out all the time. I imagine your first steps back on Earth after being in space for a while are a bit wobbly. I'm picturing a newborn fawn just kind of tripping over itself. <laughs> so cute. You've probably heard that space has a smell, maybe like burnt steak or some type of barbecue. That's true. When you come in from a space I've never walk, heard that. you're surrounded by the emptiness of space. It's sort of like the opposite of air. There's nothing there at all. When you quickly repressurize the hatch and you open up the hatch and you smell, what is that lingering smell from a place that used to be exposed to space? The smell in there is, is a little bit like that trace of a smell of gunpowder or burnt steak or to me it's sort of like brimstone, like a witch has just been there. It's a cool lingering trace of a smell. I think what it really is is the emptiness of space, the vacuum of space, is actually pulling trace chemicals out of the metal of the walls of the ship. Little bits of stuff you oh. never smell because normally there's air pressure holding them into the metal. They're slowly off-gassing those tiny little trace gases and trace particles that otherwise they never get into your nose. And those are released. Sort of that metallic gunpowder fired smell. That's where the smell is coming from. Maybe it's not even coming from space. It's just sort of coming from space's effect on our ship. Yeah, in truth, Smells a little bit like a burnt steak. That one makes sense. So there's a lot of word out there that if you go incredibly fast, like the speed of light, if you could travel at the speed of light, that you won't age. And despite thousands of years going by, you'll stay the same, but everybody that you know will die. That's not really true. Einstein called it relativity because what he meant was your aging will be different relative to people's aging on Earth. You'll still age. Time will still pass for you, but people on Earth will age at a different rate. So that if you came back after going incredibly fast, you would have gotten older by the amount of time that it took for you to travel, but people on Earth would have aged much, much faster. They would have had a longer period of time because if you get going fast enough, your speed is sort of proportional to the time passing. So you'll still age, but you just age at a different rate than people back on Earth. Einstein did this cool thought experiment. Imagine if you were looking at a clock. The, the light from the clock is coming and hitting your eyeballs and telling you it's 12 o'clock. Well, imagine if you could move away from that clock at the speed of light. It would only say 12 o'clock because that light and you would be moving away from the clock at the same speed. So for you, it would look like it was always 12 o'clock forever. You'd still be getting older, but that clock would always look like it was the same time. The people on Earth were continuing to live. They're not aware of you going the speed of light. So 
you can see that the time for you, because of your speed, is relatively different than the time for the people on Earth. It's a really unusual thing to try and grasp in your head. What famous sci-fi movie has that what as the plot? What happens when something blows up in space? If something explodes in space, will it make a sound? And could a human hear it? It's a pretty easy question to answer. The sun... If you guys remember, we watched the Planet Sounds video on this channel a while back, where they converted the radio emissions into sound waves so that humans could hear. But because there isn't sound in space as we know it, that conversion process was operative. That one stuck with me. <laughs> it's just an explosion. The sun is the biggest explosion any of us can imagine. It's a huge they had the continuous sound of the sun too. thermonuclear explosion. It's every atom bomb we've ever built, way more than that, continuously exploding. It would be the loudest thing imaginable. It's constantly happening, but we don't hear a whisper of it. And that's because there's nothing to carry the sound from the sun to us. Even though it's incredibly violent, there's nowhere for the pressure of all of that sound, all of that noise, to be carried across the emptiness of space to shake my eardrum in here and let me hear the sound of the sun. It's a good thing. It'd be deafening. So if something explodes in space, it makes sound, but there's no way for that sound to be carried across space so that I could hear it. There is this I like how you idea out that. there that maybe the only way that we could really create gravity is to spin the spaceship so that everybody is stuck to the sides like one of those rides at the fair where you're pinned against the wall. And for now, that's actually true. We don't know how to control gravity. We have no way to control gravity. We can sort of pretend there's gravity by spinning a ship and everything stick to the sides like a ball on the end of a string. Maybe someday we'll figure out how to control gravity. But for now, we have to spin the whole ship. Only in the middle would they be weightless. That was my favorite ride at the fair when I was younger, the Gravitron, where it's spinning so fast and you stick to the wall. I was a scaredy cat of that one at first. How does that even work? Like centrifugal force? Other physics words? I've seen that people Someone think let me that know. NASA is working on warp speed so that we can travel at the speed of light to interstellar planets. Warp speed is an invention of science fiction. If we knew how to work on warp speed, we would. We don't know how to go anywhere near the speed of light. It takes an unlimited amount of energy. The faster you go, the more energy it takes. E equals mc squared. It goes up with the square of the speed, in fact. So how can you generate that much electricity and what does it do to your mass? We don't know. We think maybe it's possible that you could go faster than the speed of light, but we sure don't understand how right now. So we're not really working on it. So it's not really true. We're, we're hoping for it. That one was good to know. In so many movies, you see that the only way that they survive interstellar travel from one star to another is to freeze yourself into cryosleep. We don't know how to do that. Right now, when you freeze water, which is what we're mostly made of, our blood and everything, it goes into crystals. It turns into ice crystals. And if you allow the beautiful, delicate nature of your human body to expand into ice crystals, it'll destroy the structure of you. It'll kill you, you know, frostbite destroys it so that you get gangrene in your hand, you'd end up with entirely destroyed bodies. So right now, we do not know how to successfully freeze a human body so that it is not going to be permanently destroyed. Maybe we'll figure it out someday, but all of those movies that rely on freezing the crew, we don't know how to do that. It's not real. You see on the internet all the time, someone has built a balloon and they've launched some little figurine with a camera attached to it where they take a picture way up high in the atmosphere. You can see the curvature of the earth. It's pretty cool. But there's some people thinking you could fly yourself all the way up to the stratosphere with some sort of high altitude balloon. You can actually, but it's really complicated. Felix Baumgartner, when he did his, his leap out of a balloon and actually go through the speed of sound, falling down towards the earth and landing with a parachute, he was way up into the stratosphere. The stratosphere starts at about six or seven miles up. It's, it's not all that high, but it goes on for a long way. There's not enough air to breathe. You kind of need to have an airliner with the pressure inside to keep your body healthy if you're that high. But if you take the right equipment with you, yes, we can use a balloon to lift us high enough to get all the way up into the stratosphere. So if you have the right equipment, it's true. You've probably read somewhere on the internet that if you go to the space station, your body will get taller, sort of expand, and it'll be painful, and you're going to be taller forever, an irreversible experience. And it's not really true. As I'm standing here talking right now, gravity is pushing me down towards the floor. Every single bone in my body and the little bit of gristle that's in between the bones, like each of the vertebra of my back, 
every one has a little disc in between each of the bones, and even my hip bones and my knee bones, there's a little bit of a gap. Well, if there's no gravity pushing me down, then those gaps can all get a tiny bit bigger. If you stay in weightlessness for a few weeks, in fact, your body just sort of stretches because the gap between each of the bones gets a little bigger. And in my case, I got about that much taller. But you aren't really taller, you're just sort of temporarily longer. But it's not permanent. As soon as you get home and gravity starts doing its, its work on you and grinding you down, everything squishes back down to its launch. So you may be for a little while a little bit taller in space, and it may hurt your back a little because everything's sort of getting pulled tight. Some people have back pain in space as a result, but it's not really growing. It's just sort of stretching to your natural maximum that you're going to get squished back again as soon as you get home. If you do get... That was making me think of the famous NASA twin study where they had a set of twins, both astronauts. One was sent to space, one stayed on Earth, both taking biological samples in their, you know, respective places so that they could see the effect on the human body in space. I'll find you what I can of the study and link it in the description. I'll also link it because I don't remember exactly what happened there. But at the six month mark, the brother who went to space was, I think, 90% back to normal. That's all I've got. You'll find it down below. Maybe that much longer after you've been in space for a few weeks. Think what your pants would be like. You're, you're, you know, they're going to they're gonna be high above your ankle. And if you put on a spacesuit, who custom fit the spacesuit to the size of your body? But we know it's going to happen. That looks so hard we to get actually in. plan in advance. We fit our spacesuits knowing that the astronauts are going to be a little bit taller when they're in space, or at least their bodies are going to be a little bit stretched. And even the seat that protects us when we come back to Earth, the crash seat, so that when we hit the ground it protects us properly, we allow for the fact that our backbones are going to be slightly longer when we're up there. But your clothes, you don't really know how they fit because you're floating around weightless. Your shirt is always floating around your body. So you never really have a sense up there how well your clothes fit just because there's no gravity to pull them down and look and see how well they're fitting on your body. It's more like they're just floating next to you. What's he doing there? I've read somewhere that on board the International Space Station, bacteria multiplies 10 times faster in space. So if you get sick, your body's gonna be like torn apart by this ravenous strain of, of mutant salmonella. Nah. It is a different place than Earth, the space station. We run around with little swabs all the time to measure what microbes and, and what viruses and what little uh, tiny bits of life might be growing on the spaceship. We also go around with little cleaners and wet wipes and wipe down the whole space station all the time, like in a hospital, to try and keep the whole thing clean and hygienic. And we are finding that some of those primitive forms of life do mutate slightly differently in the high radiation, weightless environment of the spaceship. but. No one has died yet because of the mutant salmonella. I'm Chris Hadfield. Hopefully this has helped answer some of those common space myths. Okay, that was another subscriber request from Wired's YouTube channel, which I'm going to link down below. We've seen a few other videos from them, one on language, another on Henry Rollins. They have a lot of random subjects. But just looking at the end cards, they do have more videos on space if you're interested in that. As far as these questions, some of the myths I'd never heard before, almost all of them are questions I hadn't asked myself, but it was cool to hear the answer. It's funny because we watch a lot of space videos on this channel, almost none of which have to do with astronauts themselves. While I was watching him, I was thinking that I don't know much about modern day astronauts at all. So if you know another video like this to recommend, we can watch it in the future. But when they were showing footage of him in space, I think it was him in space. It could be a simulation. If you know, you'll have to let me know. I was thinking about how I'm glad that people like this exist who are willing, who do want to, because it could not be me. Now I need to figure out what the Gravitron, how the Gravitron works. I'll link you whatever I find and leave your thoughts on this one. A subscriber called Jonah recommended me this book after we watched another video a while back on colonizing Mars, I ended up really liking it. It's called The Martian Chronicles, Ray Bradbury. He also wrote Fahrenheit 451 and some other short stories that I've recommended in other sci-fi videos. This is also in the sci-fi genre. And the storyline goes that people from Earth go and conquer Mars, start to colonize, and then things start going haywire with unforeseen consequences. There are already Martians there, ethical and practical questions start coming up. And I think it's an attempt to answer the question of, do humans even belong there? 
keywords for the music choices today are going to be astronaut, universe, worlds, space. If you can think of any songs related to any of those things that we haven't mentioned before, let us know. Today I'm going to start with a classic because how could I not? Rocket Man by Elton John. I'm going to guess that a good majority of you have already heard it. British musician, beautiful pianist. If you have heard the song but you haven't seen the music video, I'm going to add that for you as well. It's very melancholic though, but good storytelling. And the second choice was World Without Words by Najubis. Najubis was from Japan, and along with Jay Dilla, some say that he's the father of lo-fi. So this is a lo-fi jazzy song. It's smooth, very relaxing. It's from the soundtrack of Samurai Champloo. I may just be a very big Najubis fan, so a little bit biased. And I'm trying to think of something else. Drops of Jupiter by Train. Sometimes I like cheesy music. That's really all I have, though. I'm sure some of you are going to think of better songs than I can. So let us know. That's all from me today. Thanks for sending in this video. It was interesting. And thank you for watching with me. I'll see you next time. Hey,